Don't you miss when Jar Jar used to be the worst part of Star Wars? Yeah, me too. As you may have noticed, I've upgraded my armor, so in honor of my wizard new space threads, over the next few weeks, I'm going to be reviewing the Star Wars franchise, from Episode 1 to Rogue One, and everything in between. So let's kick things off with the first chapter of the Star Wars saga, Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. Written and directed by George Lucas, the visionary filmmaker who created not only Star Wars and Indiana Jones, but built a technological and merchandising empire of his own, giving rise to Lucasfilm back when it was actually good, Skywalker Sound, ILM, THX, and LucasArts before it was shut down by the short-sighted current leadership at Disney Lucasfilm. George Lucas and his team are also responsible for many advancements in film entertainment technology, like Photoshop, pre-visualization, and non-linear editing. Episode 1 was released in 1999 and introduced a whole new generation of moviegoers to the global phenomenon that is Star Wars. The film suffered many of the same production issues as the original Star Wars back in 1977, including sandstorms that completely destroyed their sets during their shooting in Tunisia. I hate sand. It's coarse, rough, irritating, and it gets everywhere. Now some people have a problem with midichlorians, but they were always part of George Lucas's original plan for Star Wars from the beginning, which is why the Force was strong with some people and not others. And say what you will about the prequels, at least they were carefully thought out with continuity and genuine character motivations, instead of these new Star Wars films that seem like a multi-million dollar game of telephone where one bratty kid in the group changes the story just to mess it up on purpose. The film tells the story of the fall of the Republic, turning a democracy into a dictatorship. George Lucas was inspired by actual historical events of ancient Rome. And I must say, I find it ironic how the same people that complained about politics in Star Wars whined when Episode 7 didn't have any showing good old George wasn't quite so dumb after all. It also tells of how I went from being a good-natured, pod-racing kid to being the baddest dude in the universe. When two Jedi are sent to negotiate with evil alien megacorporations, they escape the Trade Federation blockade with Queen Amidala to plead her case before the Senate. After some heroics from everyone's favorite space trash can on 2D2, our heroes head to the crap hole of the galaxy, Tatooine, for repairs which is where they meet me. Obi uses his scouter to check my power level and sees, IT'S OVER 20,000! So Qui-Gon decides to take me before the Jedi Council, but the old farts won't train me. So we head back to Naboo, and the big finale of the picture takes place. Episode 1 follows the structure of classic Star Wars films perfectly, culminating in simultaneous ground battles, space battles, and one of the best lightsaber duels ever put to film. The lightsaber fight between Darth Maul and Obi-Wan alone is worth the price of admission. Fun fact, Benicio Del Toro was originally cast as Darth Maul before he backed out of the project, giving the role instead to stuntman and martial artist Ray Park, whose electrifying performance made him an instant fan favorite despite limited screen time. Next to me, he's one of the coolest dudes in the Star Wars galaxy. And considering Del Toro's ridiculous performance as DJ in that abomination known as The Last Jedi, I think we lucked out. I honestly wouldn't be able to take Darth Maul very seriously with a Roger Rabbit stutter. Now my old buddy Jar Jar gets a lot of crap in this movie, but we wouldn't have characters like Gollum, Caesar, Avatar, Thanos, or any other modern visual effects character if it wasn't for the groundbreaking work done by ILM to make Jar Jar a reality. Ewan McGregor's Obi-Wan was perfect casting, and Ian McDermott truly shines in his role of Palpatine from Return of the Jedi. Liam Neeson is his usual grumpy self as Master Qui-Gon Jinn before he gets turned into a Jedi kebab by Darth Maul. Apparently he wasn't very mindful of his surroundings. Otherwise his life wouldn't have been taken. John Williams once again delivers a truly impressive film score, showing true mastery of his craft adding to his iconic body of work with one of the most gripping pieces he composed for the Star Wars saga, 
the duel of the fates. Now I'd like to take a moment to talk about some lazy writing here. You have an enemy engaged in a climactic battle of the film. The heroes fire one missile, destroying a ship and shutting down an entire army. Because hey, we're running out of time, and we need to wrap this picture up. Oh, I wasn't talking about Star Wars. I was talking about the Avengers. In Star Wars, it actually makes sense, because the battle droids are linked to the control ship. The Shatari, however, aren't machines, so why would destroying their mothership take down their army? People love to rag on George Lucas, but if the Phantom Menace is so badly written, why just steal his ending, Joss Whedon? Is episode one a perfect movie? No. But for its sense of fun, milestone effects work, breathtaking action set pieces, and memorable score, I give The Phantom Menace four out of five Death Stars. The force is strong with this one. Be sure to tune in next week for my review of Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. This has been Beta Reviews. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell for notifications, and follow me on Twitter. Join the Empire today. You do not yet realize your importance. Share these videos, and together we will rule the internet. And always remember, you don't know the power of the dark side.